The NFL season has arrived. We'll be hearing about life inside the front office of the defending champions and also getting a sense of the sports betting landscape as it enters its most important time of the year. Plus, the Deion Sanders and Caitlin Clark effects are alive and well, and an NFL exec made some controversial statements to a controversial source. It's Thursday, September 5th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, my colleague David Rumsey has a fascinating and wide-ranging conversation with Kansas City Chiefs President Mark Donovan. We also speak with Chad Millman, Chief Content Officer of the Action Network on the sports betting industry and how it is evolving and shaping sports media. We'll also check in on Coach Prime, Caitlin Clark, the 76ers arena plans, and a bizarre story that resulted in a Washington Commanders VP getting suspended. First, hear your headlines. Patrick Sertain II is now the highest paid cornerback in the history of the NFL after agreeing to a four-year extension with the Broncos worth $96 million, $77.5 million of which is fully guaranteed. Athlete contracts seem to only be heading upwards and the NFL is no exception, unless you're a running back. For reference, 10 years ago in 2014, the largest cap hit for a CB was Brandon Carr at $12.2 million. Sertain's new deal will basically double that. Alona Mar is going to be Dancing with the Stars. Yesterday, we heard from rugby player Cheta Emba on how rugby players have benefited from Olympic eyes, and her Team USA teammate is the latest to capitalize on the buzz. Mar just debuted as the SI swimsuit bottle for September, and will now be taking her talents to the dancing stage. She called the new endeavor a cool rite of passage, a nod to other Olympians like Simone Biles and Ryan Lochte, who have been on the show in the past. Aston Villa has refused their fan advisory board's request to cap Champions League ticket prices. Earlier this week, UEFA called for away fan tickets to be price capped in three European leagues, including the Champions League, as prices have inflated in recent years. Aston Villa, who is charging between 85 and 97 pounds for tickets, has stirred up plenty of backlash amongst its fan base already. The Aston Villa Supporters Trust called the decision extremely disappointing, which was a lot nicer than what was said amongst Twitter users. Stephen Curry has announced plans to open his own store in China. The international superstar is set to head ne east next week for an annual tour with Under Armour, who will be backing the Curry brand store. There are a few details known right now outside of the store's location and the Under Armour partnership, but Steph said he is excited to make sure people know what the Splash logo means and what it stands for and what Curry brand means and where Under Armour is going. The NFL returns tonight after 207 days without pro football. The season will open with a rematch of the 2024 AFC Championship with the Chiefs and the Ravens, but this time it will be the reigning Super Bowl champions and Patrick Mahomes hosting. Ahead of the matchup, Front Office Sports newsletter writer David Rumsey spoke with Chiefs president Mark Donovan on the pressure of a three-peat, the ongoing talks of relocation, and of course, Taylor Swift. Take a listen to that conversation now. All right, we are excited to be joined by Kansas City Chiefs President Mark Donovan here on NFL Kickoff Week. The Chiefs are, of course, hosting the Baltimore Ravens Thursday night to open the 2024 season. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, great to be with you today. Excited to get the season kicked off, and it's nice to sit and chat with you first. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we really appreciate it. Uh, it's certainly a busy week uh, for you all in Kansas City, but you do have some experience opening the NFL season as defending Super Bowl champions. Uh, what kind of business successes have you had or have you been able to capitalize from these last two Super Bowls? What has that translated to? Well, it's been a long-term um, strategy for us. Um, we talked a lot about this in 2009, 10, 11, when you know, we weren't real successful in the football field and, mm -hmm. frankly, we weren't real successful off the football field. And what we tried to do strategically is put ourselves in a position – uh, to be able to capitalize on that success. So we talked about, you know, prepare for success, Pre be ready for when you have success. You know, one of the interesting things about the business of sport and the business of the NFL, and specifically on the franchise side, is your success is somewhat limited or expanded by the success of your football team on the field. It makes perfect sense. It's logic. What we focused on was get ready for that success. Be prepared with the people, the process. You need to get fully prepared so that when this wave hits of success on the field, you're running at full steam. And looking back, that was probably one of the most 
beneficial things that we did as an organization is we got ready for it. Now, it's, it's also a little bit inspiring internally because you start to believe in those tough seasons when you're not winning football games and you know, everything is hard. You're putting in the work. You're putting in the time. You're setting up the process so that when you do have success, you're able to take on that, um, that weight. And uh, that's been what's really benefited us. Now, obviously, we've had a long success run here recently, mm-hmm. three of the last five Super Bowls. Um, I think looking back, again, having that preparation and being able to take on this, because every season is a new challenge. Um, yeah. With success comes its own problems and its own opportunities. And we were able to deal with the issues and we we're able to capitalize on the opportunities. Yeah, and, and Mark, speaking on this stadium topic uh, for looking to upgrade Arrowhead Stadium or potentially find a new home, um, can you just give an update on where the Chiefs stand heading into week one of the NFL season? Yeah, as briefly as possible. I think uh, just for perspective, you know, we went out with the Kansas City Royals and tried to extend the existing sales tax that we have last April. Uh, it was a joint effort. There was... Um, it's a complicated process for one team to do it. Sure, it's sure. even more complicated with two teams. Add on to that that one team was moving locations and one team was staying in location. So there were just a lot of variables there that I think impacted the success of that program. It did not pass um, all along in the process and, be, and during the process and then after the process. We had talked about you know, that's our first option. We'd like to pursue this option. We've got a great partnership with Jackson County that that sales tax comes from. It's worked. We've delivered against that, be- that, uh, that benefit that we've received. So we'd like to pursue that. If it doesn't work, then we've got to look at all of our options. The reality for our situation is that our lease expires in 2031. So in January, February of 2031, we're going to need a place to play that next season. If you do that timeline, then, you know, you look at, you're renovating a stadium, it's four or five years, you're building a new stadium with infrastructure and a new site and everything else, it's probably five or six years to do it right. You could do it in a compressed time frame, but that comes with its own issues. So what we've tried to do since April is identify what all the options are and have discussions, productive discussions uh, on both sides of the state line. We're in a situation where um, we literally are the chief's kingdom includes both Kansas and Missouri. Um, so we've had great discussions with the state of Kansas. They took some pretty significant action and actually elevated the benefits around a, an existing program called star bonds, which would be um, utilized to help finance a new facility. So that would be a new stadium in the state of Kansas. And then in Missouri, you know, even during the process of the vote and after the process of the vote, the, con- the conversations continued with the state of Missouri, both Jackson County, the city of Kansas City, and the state of Missouri, on how we can renovate and make Arrowhead last yeah. even longer. Um, so those conversations continue um, as of the last week. Um, so we recently had our kickoff um, breakfast um, with basically all of the business leaders in Kansas yeah. City. It's a long-term Um, tradition. And it's the first time we've had governors from both the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri at that event. And I think that shows the the value that people are putting on the Kansas City Chiefs as a franchise and the opportunity to, you know, either renovate and expand on the success of this iconic stadium, DHA Field, or build a brand new stadium. And I think the one thing that that also proves, and I think those people who are in the room know, is that the economic impact of any National Football League franchise is significant on the region. For us, back to your first question of how we've expanded on the success of the team, you know, last year, we had a billion dollar economic impact on the state of Missouri and the region of Kansas City. That's a significant business. That generates a significant amount of tax revenue that goes to the state, the city, the county. So those are things that we deliver as part of being a part of this community. So those two governors and those two organizations, the state organizations, the county organizations, they look at this and they they see real value. So where we are is we're evaluating our options. Um, We're we're in the process and it's a pretty, um, we're we're pretty far along in the process, I would say. 
Um, and we, we like our option. So we just got to figure out what makes the most sense for our fans, what makes the most sense for this organization, and what makes the most sense for the future. Mark, within the organization, obviously stadium projects are hard for anybody across the country, across any sports, but has this particular one in Kansas City been a distraction at all for the team? It try, just trying to capitalize on that success of being two-time defending Super Bowl champions. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that really shows the success of this franchise, and it's the structure. Um, Clark Hunt did a great job of saying, I want to put leaders in place, empower them to do their jobs, um, and make sure that the leaders in place all respect each other and appreciate why we're here. So, you know, myself as a president, our head coach, Andy Reid, and our general manager, Brett Beach, we all report to Clark. We all have our stated responsibilities, but the reality is there's overlap every single day. Um, you know, Brett does an amazing job with talent evaluation and players and um, the draft and salary cap and everything else. Coach does a Hall of Fame level uh, job at the head coaching job. I'm just trying to keep up with those two. Um, but the reality is that, to your question, part of the job is to make sure that we're eliminating those distractions. Mm -hmm. So while the stadium process and the stadium vote process was all encompassing for me and members of my team, it did not impact them. They were not part of it. You know, we weren't really updating them on a weekly basis. I would ask, answer the questions when they asked because it was a big news story. But our job is to eliminate that distractions from the football team. And that just goes back to, you know, the direction that Clark has given us is we're a football team. Our goal is to win games and consistently compete for championships. Let's just make sure everybody's working towards that goal. Now, at the same time, we have this amazing opportunity to expand our business because of the success of this franchise. Let's make sure we all remember that winning football games is what really gives us those opportunities. And that's really what's driven us. Yeah. Yeah. So. Obviously, that's all kind of like future planning, 2020, 2031, et cetera. As we head back to this season, um, there's no denying that last year the Chiefs were at the center of the effect that Taylor Swift had on the NFL. Uh, her and Travis Kelsey are obviously still going strong. Has the organization done anything this offseason just to brace for that impact again? Um, I wouldn't say brace for it. Um, I think it's a, an amazing story. Um, you got two really, really special people in the middle of this historic opportunity, right? To win a third Super Bowl in a row. Um, I will say this about Taylor and Travis. Um, one of the reasons that I think they are so um, impactful to the entire world, um, but specifically to the Kansas City region and even more specifically to Chiefs Kingdom. Mm -hmm. they're, they're both really authentic. And one of the things you learn in Kansas City is if you're not authentic, it doesn't work. People see through it. And if you are authentic, they will embrace you. And that has happened with both of them, obviously, through Travis's career, um, but also through recently with Tra um, Taylor becoming a member of the kingdom. And, th and that's how we look at it, is we're excited that she's an authentic Chiefs fan. And that she's authentically a part of this community. And we've adopted her in Chief's Kingdom. Um, now, with Taylor, she brings a lot with her. <laughs> and uh, it's a pretty valuable targeted demographic when you look at the makeup of her fan base. Um, and we've looked at ways that we can be respectful. Sure. I had a great conversation with, with Travis the first game that Taylor came to. Hmm. Um, this was prior to the game. Uh, and... I grabbed Travis after practice and just said, hey, I'm hearing through the grapevine that uh, Taylor's coming to the game. Uh, he said, yeah, she wants to come to the game. That's on her. I'm going to focus on the game. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, it's Taylor Swift. So yeah. we sort of have to plan for this and make sure we, we've got a plan for her. We're going to take her through these certain entrances and you know, make sure that she's safe and make sure that we manage the crowd reaction. Um, and Travis's response was, she wants to come as a fan. She doesn't want all this stuff. Deal with her. I'm playing football. <clears throat> and I was like, okay, but, you know, she can't come through the main gate. That's not going <laughs> to work. And he said, no, she wants to come through the main gate like a fan. I'm like, Travis, I'm like, I, I, I can't happen. And uh, so we had this entire intricate plan. Her security team came the day before. We had this great way of getting her in and out. Everything was going to be great. You know, 
you know, not unlike we do with other BVIPs. Yeah. So the day of the game, I get a call from our head of security saying, uh, Taylor doesn't like the plan. She's coming through the main gate. <laughs> and she did. Um, she, you know, put on a hat and uh, a COVID mask and some sunglasses and brought a group of people and they all came right through the main gate. Um, because that's what she wants. She wants to be a fan, right? This is her off time. She wants to be there and support Travis. Um, and we're going to crew create that opportunity. We're going to provide that opportunity. The last point I'll make on Taylor, and this is another conversation we had with Travis, was we did our very best to respect the relationship, sure. right? right? So, you know, every week you see every single game broadcast that we have, they're looking for Taylor. Um, we made a conscious decision to respect the relationship. Yeah. Um, not unlike any other player um, and their relationship. And uh, I think it's it's telling that, you know, we conscious decision to the point of last season in Arrowhead Stadium and GHA Field, we didn't play a single Taylor Swift song hmm. during our games. And that, that was a, shine, a sign of respect. Like yeah. this, yeah. We're not trying to capitalize on this. We're trying to celebrate it, but it's not about, you know, doing too much or showing her every touchdown or anything like that. Hmm. Um, she never appeared on our big board. Um, we had one day when we had – you know, six or seven big celebrities uh, in the stadium. And so prior to the game, you know, we show them on the sideline and put them on the big board and the fans react. And it's a, it's a, another way of saying, like, this is the place to be. The coolest people in entertainment are here too. And I went to Travis afterwards. And I'm like, it's a little odd to me that we showed like four Hollywood people, two entertainers, a comedian, and Taylor's in her suite watching, but we're not showing her. <laughs> He's like, let's just keep doing it the way we're doing it. So yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's that's all great. And so I mean, just by judging all that, I know she has. I mean, the Chiefs have like three home games, I think, before her tour picks back up. They love supporting each other. Sounds like you're probably not even making changes to your security or luxury suite area. Sounds like you guys have that all handled. Yeah, we've got a great process, and uh, and uh, we'll be prepared for her, and uh, obviously welcome with open arms. Yeah. So Thursday night, Chiefs Ravens kick off the season. Okay, well, Mark, this has been great as we kind of wrap up here. One more back on the field, um, trying to do a historic three-peat, right, this offseason for the Chiefs. A lot of a big contract signed, whether it's Andy Reid or several positions becoming the highest paid player at their position. Obviously, some of that takes ownership approval um, for the other side of the front office. Um, can you just speak on, is it kind of this feeling of let's invest in the team now while this huge Super Bowl window is, is open? Uh, I think that's part of it. I think that, um, you know, Clark's mandate to us and specifically to coach and to Brett Beach, our GM, was consistently compete for championships. So, you know, if you really take that apart, it's being consistent, but it's being consistent at this really high level, which is really difficult. So you're making hard decisions every year on what are you going to do with contracts and how do you extend the right guys, making sure you're doing it at the right time. I think that Brett Beach and his team have done an amazing job of that. The collaboration between Brett and Andy and the entire coaching staff is probably um, one of the more impressive things about our organization is our coaches are involved with our GM on, you know, players and evaluations as well as you know, opportunities that we look at. So I think that um, you know, we're going to continue down the path of trying to make sure we keep the core together um, and try to add where we can and when we can. Um, last season was a great example of that with some key players coming in and making serious contributions to our Super Bowl wins this year. I think we've done it again. Um, and again, Brett and his team deserve all the credit for that. Excited about the opportunity to go and make some history. Um, I think it was one of the cooler things about training camp this year was the players and coaches approach to this season is, is consistent with that is this is an amazing opportunity. And let's go do everything we possibly can to take advantage of it. And less of the, you know, everybody talks about, you know, the stress and the pressure of, you know, being in a position like this. We, we look at it, and I know this team looks at it differently. They look at it as, you know, we worked really hard to be in this position. Let's go take advantage of it and work even harder to accomplish it. So I guess that on the business side, you're able to just kind of lean into that. I mean, are there any specific plans for... I mean, you don't want to get ahead of yourself with a three-peat talk, right? But it sounds like you're really leaning into that rather than saying, don't even talk about it. Yeah, you can't ignore it, right? So we, we have been pretty um, aggressive and strategic on how can we utilize this opportunity. Um, 
But I think it's important to point out that in all of those conversations, we do an evaluation of will this create a distraction and how can we limit the distraction to our football team. And that's an important point for us as an organization. I mean, you can imagine the opportunities that have come across our desk since last year hmm. are significant. Um, and, and you've got to take a measured approach to that. We've got to take advantage of the right ones. We've got to, we've got to execute them the right way. Um, but we also have to turn down a lot. And um, some of it just, you know, some of it's easy. Like that's going to be a huge distraction. We're not in the market for that. Some of it's more difficult. It's nuanced. Like, could we actually do it this way? Um, and then some of them, you know, have been really exciting for us to be able to say, okay, we probably wouldn't be in this position to have this opportunity. Let's go do this and do it right. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done a lot already. Um, I think just as an example, you know, last year going into the playoffs, we, we created this playoff promotion called Tis the Season. And it was our way and Laura Kruger and our CMO, they really deserve the credit of like coming with coming together and trying to create something that capitalizes on the playoffs for us. We've been in the playoffs so consistently, like it's become sort of our season. And so they combined that with a holiday theme. They actually branded it, kind of branded it around the Hallmark um, holiday theme movies and created this, this movie promo that was really tied around promoting playoffs. And even I think the second or third time I watched it, I said, you know, this could be sort of <laughs> like Ted Lasso, right? Yeah. Ted Lasso was created to promote Premier Soccer on NBC. And then I was like, well, let's just make a show out of it. And, uh, you know, we've already started shooting and, it'll, you know, I know it's been announced that Hallmark is going to actually do a film now um, based on that promotion. A little bit different story, but based on the promotion. And that's an opportunity that, hey, we can take advantage of that. We we can leverage that and we can do it in a way that doesn't distract from the football team. So that's kind of an opportunity we're trying to take advantage of. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Hallmark and Netflix uh, this holiday season is where you can find the Chiefs, right? Yeah. Um, Mark, thanks so much uh, being for being so generous with your time here on a busy week for you and the Chiefs organization. So we enjoyed it. Best of luck Thursday in this season. We're excited to uh, kick things off. All right. Thanks. Good to be with you. Thanks. For the first time in 18 years, an American man will be in the U.S. Open final. We don't know if that will be Taylor Fritz or Francis Tiafo, but the two of them will play each other on Friday's semifinal match. The winner will play either Yannick Sinner or Daniel Medvedev in the final. The last American to make any Grand Slam final was Andy Roddick, who lost to Roger Federer at Wimbledon in 2009. Roddick made the U.S. Open final in 2006, where he ran into the middle of Federer's five consecutive U.S. Open victories. Roddick did win the tournament in 2003 at a time when no one was anticipating a 21-year drought for American men. The previous final was between two Americans, Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi. While there are structural reasons for the drought, there's also the fact that since Roddick's victory, 12 of the 20 U.S. Opens have been won by Federer, Nadal, or Djokovic. We may be entering a more open men's tennis landscape for the first time in two decades. Last year, Deion Sanders had some surprising wins on the field, but his more consistent success came in sunglasses sales. Prime was the most public booster of Blender's eyewear, with which he has a signature line. Blender's founder, Chase Fisher, told Front Office Sports that the company has sold over 200,000 Sanders-branded shades since last year, adding, it's been a remarkable partnership. That puts revenue from Deion's line at a minimum of $13.4 million in the past 12 months. Fisher said that the initial demand was so high that they had to renegotiate contracts with their factories to move up production of the primes. Colorado is paying Sanders just under $6 million per season, but his return to the national spotlight may be worth all that and more. The Caitlin Clark effect is very real both on and off the court. Friday's game between her team, the Indiana Fever, and Angel Reese's Chicago Sky drew 1.6 million viewers on ION, with a peak just under 2 million. It was the fifth time this year Ion had an audience of over a million, and all five of those games had involved the fever. Indiana won that game and their next one against the Dallas Wings, which pushed them above 500 for the first time in five years. The streak also earned the fever their first playoff berth in seven years. The Sky are battling for the final spot. The WNBA season is in its final two weeks, and the playoffs begin on September 22nd. The Philadelphia 76ers confirm that they are considering becoming the third major sports team to play in New Jersey while affiliating themselves with a major city outside the state. 
Previous reports indicated that the team was considering relocating across the Delaware River to Camden with the help of $400 million in tax incentives from New Jersey. A team spokesperson told the Associated Press, quote, The reality is we are running out of time to reach an agreement that will allow the 76ers to open our new home in time for the 2031-32 NBA season. As a result, we must take all potential options seriously, including this one. To be fair to the Sixers, this was not plan A. They wanted a new arena in downtown Philadelphia. That has met with local resistance, however, so the team may be tempted to go to the fertile territory of the Garden State. The one thing they don't seem willing to do is just stay at the Wells Fargo Center, where they have played since 1996. Sports betting has had a tumultuous first six years as a legal activity in the United States, with companies rising and falling. Now it is entering its most important time of the year with the NFL kicking off. I spoke to Action Network Chief Content Officer Chad Millman about the state of the industry and how it is going deeper into sports media. Joined now by Chad Millman, Chief Content Officer at Action Network. Welcome, Chad. Hey, how are you? Great, great to have you on. Uh, so we're heading into football season. What would you? Say? I just want to get kind of a state of the sports betting industry right now. Um, you know, have we kind of uh, reached a certain equilibrium in terms of who who the big players are in terms of like FanDuel, DraftKings? I wouldn't say settled. It feel, it still feels pretty chaotic, right? It's, it's still a nascent industry. I think what we've seen is a lot of the players who launched, and when I say players, I mean operators and people who wanted to get into the space and take advantage of this gold rush for sports betting and the legalization that was happening. You've seen a lot of those players fall by the wayside. They've left markets. They've left the U.S. and sports betting if they were European operators completely. They're U.S. operators who have decided that they're not going to participate in sports betting. They're just going to focus on sort of retail gambling. And then there's operators like PointsBet that have been consumed and, and purchased by uh, fanatics, um, for example. So what you're seeing is sort of a combination of consolidation and the companies that couldn't, couldn't finance the barriers to entry and it's expensive to play in the sports betting market. Uh, those have fallen by the wayside. And what you've really seen is a lot of what the reporting has been about, whether it's front office sports or other places, there's two major players. There's FanDuel and there's DraftKings. And then there's a, a sort of group of a group of five, you can call it, who are competing for what will ultimately be third place, whether that's the BetMGMs, the ESPN bets, the Fanatics, the Bet365s, uh, the Caesars to some extent. Um, but we've certainly seen consolidation and sort of settling of who the leaders are. Yeah, and I'm curious about well, like what that race for third place means, because like, is there room for five other players? And now obviously there are others, you know, that are still trying to worm their way in there. But yeah, there's DraftKings, there's FanDuel. And yeah, then there's a bunch of others, you know, some have the big name like ESPN, Fanatics to some degree. Um, you know, some just have more of a, a legacy in the sports betting world. Um, but I'm wondering, like, you know, if we're talking, obviously, it's hard with the stuff to know what things are going to look like five, 10 years out, especially because we could get California, Texas opening up huge new markets. Yeah. But because there's such a barrier to entry um, and there's a lot of taxes, there's just it's expensive to get into this market and to be in this market. Um, how much room there is beyond DraftKings and FanDuel? Like, it seems like there's room for at least two more, I would say. But I'm wondering if there's really space beyond that long term well look it's hard to say what the ultimate number is going to be whether you're talking about the rental car business the airline business the ai business the social media business like what is the market capacity for any business right and so right now what we're seeing is that there are two major players and that there's a bunch of people who would like to get into that sort of next layer say three four five does it go beyond five all of a sudden becomes really good at their at their business and also as you pointed out there are more markets to contend with there was a rush of legalization a rush of states jumping into the sports betting business that has slowed down considerably over the last 12 months and it and it won't be that much more that there won't be that many more entrants into the space over the next 12 months 
So it is really what you're talking about, which is places like California, places like Texas, when they come into the market, that will create such a flood of interest and a much bigger TAM for individuals, uh, operators who are looking to get legal in a state. So that will be something that we get a better sense of, all right, is this three players? Is it four players? Is it seven players? Can all five of the books that are now competing for third place actually make significant revenue if these states come online? That has a huge impact on what the market is going to look like. Yeah. And do we, I mean, that, that feels like a big question though. Like, you know, let's say California legalizes soon. It won't be tomorrow. Um, but yeah, you know, let's say it happens I mean, for ESPN bed and fanatics to try to like really make up ground from DraftKings, FanDuel. Um, do we have a sense of what actually happens when a big market opens up? Cause I, my guess would be that you'd kind of see the same ratios going forward that, you know, about FanDuel gets a third, DraftKings gets a third and everyone else kind of fights over the rest. Well, we don't have a real sense of it for places like Fanatics and ESPN Bet being in the market with the offerings that they have, right? Those are still relatively new businesses, new products still developing. ESPN has talked a lot about how they are advancing the integrations and what they will be launching in 2025 with their direct-to-consumer product and how that is going to cater a lot to fantasy players and betters. And so we have yet to see the full-fledged operation of what the power of that can be. Uh, at Action Network, we're, we're hopeful everybody wins, right? We win when there are more betters. We win when there are more operators. We win when there is diversity in the market. We're Switzerland. We work with all the operators because our audience is so big that they want to engage with us and try to get access to our clients and our customers. But um, I think it, when we get to California, when we get to Texas, we're going to have a much different marketplace than we had in the first 24, 30 months of legalization. In that window, we had upwards of 35, 36 states legalizing. But that has slowed down so considerably over the last 12 to 14 months that we haven't seen what it looks like when the players who have invested, who have deep pockets, who, who have a lot of incentive to make this work, speaking specifically Fanatics and ESPN bet, we haven't seen what it's like when they are at full scale entering the market at the same time with multiple markets available after DraftKings and FanDuel. We've only seen a couple instances uh, of that in evidence so far. One thing you're starting to get into there is the relationship between the sports betting industry and sports media. I mean, you guys are somewhat unique in that you're, you're all in on sports betting, but you're not a, a sports book. Uh, you know, you're not competing with, with everyone we've been talking about. Um, uh, whereas someone like ESPN is, you know, obviously is the media empire and is going to try to figure out how to, you know, it's like, I'm already on, I'm watching something on ESPN. I'm on ESPN.com. How quickly can they, how easily can they make it? So I just press a button and then now I've placed a bet. Um, and then we see players like DraftKings and FanDuel, you know, FanDuel has FanDuel TV and, you know, DraftKings got its, has its own media network. So they're trying to do it from that direction. Um, that's more of just a bunch of thoughts than a question. But well, I, you're not, but I know what you're getting, which is basically the betting companies want to be in media. The media companies want to be in betting. And we've seen this from both sides. You, we, like I said, action is uniquely positioned. I like how we're positioned. We specifically did not try to become an operator. I was at ESPN for a long time. I was the editor in chief of the magazine. I was editorial director for ESPN digital. I started the sports betting beat. It's what, my side hustle was at ESPN going back 20 years when I first started at ESPN, right? I mean, I wrote a book about guys who bet on sports for a living in 1999 and used that information and used those contacts and started to write about the sports betting industry and how professional bettors were thinking about lines and why they were moving and where money was going. And that sort of blossomed into a full-fledged beat that led me to ultimately leaving ESPN to launch action in 2017 with a company called The Churning Group. When we launched, we very specifically were positioning ourselves to be the intermediary between customers and consumers and bettors 
and the operators. We were going to bring in with authentic voices, authentic, incredible information that could not be compromised because we were not beholden to any single operator, right? We just want to be the experts who knew what was going on. That's a different position than, say, an ESPN, which is strategically aligned with the ESPN bet, or a bet MGM, which is also trying to do video that they post on Twitter from expert bookmakers who are telling you where the lines are going, or a FanDuel TV or DraftKings, you know, what they're doing with their fast channel. So it creates a different experience for the customer. The much larger companies, and we were acquired in, in 2021 by a global business called Better Collective, but the businesses that are ESPN scale, DraftKings scale, FanDuel scale, they would like to be all things to all people, right? The, in every respect, even fanatics. So that that does sort of make it a little more challenging to figure out inside the business, what are you going to be? And I do wonder if that's going to be a problem already or at some point of, yeah, I mean, I think ESPN is kind of the best example here of, you know, I, I'm reading some analysis of, you know, who the, who the best picks are on ESPN. And then ESPN bet says, now you can bet on these people. I mean, right there, there's sort of a conflict of they want me to lose the bet. The the bet the sports book wants me to lose the bet. The ESPN writer wants presumably wants to give me a good pick. Um, and, and you know, as media and sports betting get more and more integrated, and that seems like that's going to be the trend going on. I mean, there's that conflict of interest, and I I also just have this sense of like there are probably other conflicts that I'm not thinking of that are there too, either, you know, under the surface or, you know, present right now. I I'm just wondering how you think about all that. I think about it a lot, actually, um, because it's something that everybody in this space is constantly going to be confronted with, right? And if you are giving out information and then you are also aligned with operators as we are, or if you are an operator yourself, whether that's ESPN bet or DraftKings or FanDuel, you are going to have to defend yourself in that space. And I, I know for a fact, and I'm sure this is true all over media, if someone is going on television, if someone is presenting a pick on social media, if someone is writing a story telling you to take a side, they are not thinking, I want to make this person lose because that only impacts them. And I will tell you right now that anyone in media is inherently selfish and they are thinking about what is good for my brand in addition to how can they help the company, right? And so there is nobody who is saying, I'm going to purposely lose bets because that will help the business. A, it won't help the business because the only way to gain credibility and to gain trust is to get people to consistently come back and they are only going to consistently come back. Your audience is only going to grow. You're only going to get more viewers, you, more users. If you are good at what you do, if you are open about what you do, if you are transparent about the picks you make and when they win and when they lose and when they lose, you're not trying to overly defend it. You're explaining what happened and you move on to the next pick. Um, that to me is how everyone in the media is approaching it. I don't, I think it's a, it's a false premise to believe that, you know, there is an operator who is whispering in the ear of a producer saying, we're heavy on one side, make sure people take the other side. That's just not how it works. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's fair. And do you see other, um, just potential conflicts or just uneasiness, uh, in, in this, um, you know, ongoing kind of dance that media and sports betting are doing? Well, you know, it's, it's. I don't personally, I think there are going to be people who want to think about, is this good for media? Is it good that every show, that every story has some kind of integration, whether it's a FanDuel commercial on inside the NBA, on TNT, or it's some kind of ESPN bet sponsorship and integration on Monday Night Football. Um, Betting is not something that everybody wants to engage with. And I think what a lot of people in media are discovering is where is that fine line between communicating with the masses who are interested in the game, but they're not betters, and then speaking to the betting community. How do you sort of thread that needle 
to make sure that you can give everything and super serve all of the fans and as many fans as you possibly can. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge that everyone in the media faces right now. So we had the Jonte Porter situation last year where, you know, an NBA player who is, you know, fringy work with some unscrupulous gamblers to, um, you know, bet the under on on his you know, points totals and other other prop bets. And, you know, lo and behold, five minutes into the game, he aggravates an injury and says, oh, I, I got to bow out. Um, that's probably not going to be a huge issue at the highest level because these guys are making millions, tens of millions of dollars. It's just going you're going to have to have an absurdly large conspiracy to make anything worth it at that level. On college, on the other hand, if you got a prop bet that, you know, some kid who's not making any money or making very little um, and, you know, maybe he doesn't know the rules or, you know, even if he does know the rules uh, or she knows the rules. Anyway, that feels like more of an opportunity and, you know, more the type of corruption that does exist of, you know, a fringy tennis player losing the first set. Then, you know, someone puts $10,000 on him doing that. I'm, I'm wondering how big a conversation this is. I think that the fixing of games and the integrity of the games, that's the paramount concern for anyone who's in the sports betting space or in the leagues or their operators, because you can't have people betting if they feel like the deck is stacked against them. There is no market if people don't believe in the fairness of the market, right? And that's true of any market. Just look at the stock market, the private equity market, whatever. Like if people don't believe that they have a fair shake, that what they're seeing in front of them gives them an opportunity that is on equal footing with everybody else, then they're just not going to invest in it. So obviously it's of paramount importance. Things like Jean T. Porter, when they come up, I agree with you, they are more likely to happen with players like that. I actually feel like that was a good warning shot, right? Because it was caught quickly. Uh, it was dealt with quickly and harshly by the NBA. Um, and now players have sort of understood, oh no, like I can't mess around with this, right? I've got to be above board. I can't try to make a quick 10, 15, 20 grand by feeding this information. You know, years ago when I was at ESPN, uh, Delaware legalized sports betting. And at the same time, New Jersey had filed a lawsuit to overturn the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act, which was the federal ban on sports betting. That case ultimately became the case that got to the Supreme Court and had the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act overturned and betting became legal on a state-by-state -state basis. So when that suit was first filed, I did a story about this for E60, the, the news magazine TV show on ESPN. And I was doing interviews with people in New Jersey and in Delaware and in Baltimore and Philly, like areas that were sort of connected to where a lot of this was in the center. And one of the guys I spoke to was Terrell Suggs, who at the time was a defensive end of his career. And I asked him, like, are players concerned about this? He goes, I'm not concerned for myself. I'm not concerned for our quarterback or our running back or our wide receiver. I'm concerned about the third string defensive back who has information and might cavalierly or, you know, innocently think they are sharing information with a friend and that information all of a sudden becomes a benefit to somebody who want to make bets, wants to make bets on the game or can compromise that player. We've seen now what can happen if someone is taking that to the extreme with Jante Porter. I think that's a really powerful message. I think that's one of the benefits of having it being legal is there are so many more watchdogs. It's not like there wasn't gambling before it became legal state by state in 2018. Gambling has been going on for a hundred years or more just on sports. Forget about in history, right? So this has been going on for a long time. Now we just have more sort of more of a clean, well-lighted space. Very interesting stuff. Chad Millman, thank you so much for joining us on the show. You bet. Time for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. 
Four of the best golfers in the world are squaring off next month in a battle of pro tours, fighting for a fleeting moment of supremacy in the ever-changing golf world. Bryson DeChambeau and Brooks Kepka will be representing Live Golf together in a made-for-TV matchup against Scotty Scheffler and Rory McIlroy, who are representing the PGA Tour. For Bryson and Brooks, this feels like a microcosm for the rebuilt relationship, which was quite shaky for some time. In the past, Kepka has criticized DeChambeau's cadence on the course, saying, I just don't understand how it takes a minute and 20 seconds to hit a golf ball. It's not that hard. Bryson once said of Brooks, I don't know if his genetics even make him look good. And then, of course, there was the infamous interview of 2021 when DeChambeau distracted Kepka during his golf TV sit down and elicited a visible eye roll and S-bomb on TV. Of course, this was before the duo joined Live Golf, where they have been on tour together for the past two years. Safe to say the relationship has been somewhat mended in that time because three years ago it would have been impossible to imagine them playing together. The Live PGA contest will air on TNT in mid-December. McElroy noted that this isn't just a contest between some of golf's major champions. It's an event designed to energize the fans. We're all here to put on a great show and contribute to a goodwill event that brings the best together again. Feels like we are still far off from a true Live PGA merger, so this is the best we're going to get for now. Before we go, here's an interesting story that raises all kinds of questions. The Washington Commanders suspended Vice President Rael Antin after a video surfaced in which he said the following. Get ready. Over half the team's roster is homophobic. Some players are dumb as hell and become more susceptible to conspiracy theories after getting hit in the head too many times. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones hates black people and gay people. Commissioner Roger Goodell is a $50 million puppet. The NFL's efforts around DEI are entirely performative and all about preserving the league's profits. And that most of the NFL's fans are high school educated alcoholics and mouth breathers. He also said, quote, there were pipes leaking sewage on their fans in the middle of the game. And I have to put out a social post saying it wasn't sewage water. We promise that is state run media. Obviously, wherever the video came from, the commanders are going to disassociate themselves here and Antin will probably be out of a job soon. But where did this video come from? It was put out by O'Keefe Media Group, who hire, quote, undercover reporters to take videos of people presumably without their knowledge. The reporter in question here met Antin on the dating app, Hinge. They went out to dinner twice and it was at one of those dates that she took the video. While the media company doesn't claim any partisan lean on its website, it was founded by far-right activist James O'Keefe, who also founded Project Veritas, which became known for selectively, often misleadingly, editing videos of left-leaning people. And Teen said what he said, and he'll face the consequences for that. But it's worth taking a moment to think about the ethics behind this whole thing. That's it for today, but before we go, you've heard my takes, now I want to hear yours. If you have a comment about anything we covered, let us know by sending an email to today at frontofficesports.com and we might read your comments on the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.